Hi everyone, Rabbi Yisrael Bernath here. As I'm assuming you would know if you're not living under a rock, Ukraine has been under attack since the early morning of February 24th. And as Jews, it's just a reality of our lives that when something catastrophic happens, we tend to think about how does this affect the Jews? And I know that for most of us who are living in Western countries, we often forget about the history of the Jewish community in Ukraine, past, and I would say even present, what's going on. There is an entire population in danger. There are 350,000 Jews who call Ukraine home. That is the third largest Jewish community in Europe and the fifth largest Jewish community in the world. And for many Jews around the world, the name Ukraine conjures up images of the place their grandparents or their ancestors fled in the late 1800s or the early 1900s, or as a region where millions of Jews were murdered during the Holocaust. What I wanted to do today is go through I'm not going to say a complete history, but a brief history to just remind you probably of things that you already know, but maybe forgot. And I think now that Ukraine is on top of our minds, I think it's important for us in the Jewish community to think about some of the past, some of the present, and maybe to have some kind of internal conversation. So I love to just have a conversation with you about this. Unfortunately, I know that to a certain extent it's one way, but you're welcome to uh, post comments and ideas, uh, things that maybe I'm going to miss out in this monologue. And I love to continue this conversation, especially since I think it's really, really important right now. Uh, now, I'm going to assume because I don't know how many of you are aware of the history of the Jews of Ukraine. I don't, I don't only mean the 20th century, although I'm gonna get to that. I mean the history of the Jews of Ukraine in the 1700s uh, and in the 1600s, the 15th and 16th century. So during that time, the Jews began to move into what was the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. And they began to move there in great numbers. And that increased over time. And they were living as Jews in the late Middle Ages and past the Middle Ages pretty well. They were fairly well integrated into the world around them. Actually, that was unique for the time because there were not many countries during that time that the Jews could actually be well integrated and live fairly well uh, during that time, and Ukraine was one of those countries. Um, in 1648, there was a man by the name of Bogdan Chemelnitsky, who was a military hero, and he helped create a revolt. And a war began in 1648 that lasted through 1649. It was actually, uh, traditionally, within the Jewish community, it is known as Gezerot Tach Vetat. Tach Vetat is an abbreviation for 1648 and 1649. What, what exactly happened was the Ukrainian uh, rebels went after Russia, funny enough, the opposite way around of what's going on now. And in the retreat, they slaughtered thousands upon thousands of Jews. Actually, a third of the entire population of Ukraine, uh, of the Jewish population of Ukraine was killed. It's very hard to think of that time, but it's an important time in Jewish history. What's also interesting to note is that that time, so many of the people, the Jews of that time, were whoever was left. They had family, they had friends, 
that were killed in what was called the Chemonitsky pogroms or Gezerot Tachvatat. The tens of thousands of Jews were massacred. And it left the Jews of the region in despair. Now, in that time, the Jewish community was split between the learned and the unlearned. People who were unlearned were really didn't know much. They relied a lot on the rabbis. They relied a lot on the leadership. And the people who were learned uh, were a little bit disconnected. What was interesting, why I'm bringing this up, is because it was a direct result of these unlearned people who had lost their families, who were in a disarray, that actually gave birth to the Hasidic movement. So after those attacks, there was a young rabbi named Rabbi Israel Baal Shem Tov, who became later the founder of the Hasidic movement. He was born in that region in 1698, so just a few years after that time. And he began to travel the countryside and to uplift a really broken people, a people who were who didn't know who, who to look for, who to find guidance. Uh, and he actually came to them with a, a simple message of love and happiness and, and a way to serve God. And it became very popular. And the populist idea amongst the simple Jewish community of Ukraine is what gave birth to the Hasidic movement, which is probably the most thriving movement within Jewry today. I mean, I know it's debatable, but I would say so. There was actually um, a rabbi of Krakow who was a scholar and a writer and a teacher. And he wrote something uh, of the time, during that time uh, of the, the, the Gezer Tach Vatat. And I'll read you a bit of what he wrote. He said, I, I lay alone with a broken leg, lame and crippled, when God destroyed the Polish and Lithuanian communities, everything I valued was taken from me, my wealth and my possessions, my family, he continues, saying my two little girls murdered as martyrs and the holy books that I had written. I thought I would be cut off from the land of the living for I was defiled and filthy, rolling in the blood of the martyrs on the street for who had given up their souls to die. I was starving and so thirsty that my tongue stuck to my palate. The enemies brought me to be killed many times and I stretched out my neck like a lamb to the slaughter, but God in his great mercy has kept me alive until this day in the land of the survivors. And that was written about a decade after this Gezerah Tachvatat. And the, these people who were survived, most of them actually became refugees. And a large percentage of those refugees were sold into slavery. The, um, the Turks, I think the Tartars, they took the Jews and they sold them as slaves, especially in Istanbul, was, which was the capital of the slave trade at that time. And you can imagine this, the Ukrainian Jews taken by the Tartars to Istanbul to be sold as slaves. And what happened as a result was that the entire Jewish world started raising money for what we call Pidyan Shvuim, the redeeming of captives, which is a very important mitzvah. There, during that time, it became so pronounced that there were people, simple Jews, who were sold into slavery and the Jewish community wanted to redeem them. There are so many stories that are written, but it really, I would say without, and I'm really not going into as much detail as I wanted to, but without truly understanding Gezero Tachvatat, this Chimonispi pogroms, you really don't understand what happened to the Jewish community of Eastern Europe and maybe what's happening today and what our response is, because so many Jews either sold into slavery or escaped. I mean, later there were other pogroms, but many of the Jews that later made their way, and I'm saying in the late 1800s and early 1900s to, to the United States, to Canada, 
to South uh, Africa, to uh, some of them to Australia, to some of these Western countries, or what we know today as the Western countries, were as a result of these types of pogroms, this one probably being one of the great pogroms that unfortunately is not known enough. And we can see this really strongly within the, the, the memories, etched into the memories of the Ukrainian Jewish community. Now, I bring this up because this is the reality of Jewish history. And when we hear the word Ukraine within the Jewish community, we think of that long history, the long history with the people of Ukraine and the deep anti-Semitism, not only during that time, but obviously further on, and especially during the Holocaust, the deep anti-Semitism of the people of Ukraine. And after that time, things calmed down and Jews began to rebuild. And that's what we do. I mean, especially in times when things calm down, we go back and we try to forget what happened in the past. We try to forget that which we lost and we rebuild and we the Jews at that time actually physically dug up possessions that they had buried when they fled. And that's why when World War II started, there were 3 million Jews in Poland. 3 million Jews in Poland. Because around that area, in the Commonwealth of Lithuania and Poland and Ukraine, so many Jews during those few hundred years in between Gezer Tafkatat and and later on into the you know before the pogroms and the and World War II, they were able to rebuild, and they managed to rebuild. And Ukraine became one of those places that was really good for the Jewish people. Now, we know that Jewish history repeats itself, and if you think about how there's a there's a terminology that is used with regards to the destruction of the temple. It's called Khurban. Well, there's only one other time that I know of that I could think of. And again, I'm, I'm speaking offhand, but there's only one other time that I can think of that the word Khurban, destruction, is used aside for the destruction of the temple. And that was a destruction of the Jews of Ukraine. So until the 20th century, until the Holocaust, that Chimonisky, the Chimonisky pogrom was thought of as the equivalent of a destruction of the temple. Yet the Jewish people in Ukraine rebuilt. And even in the beginning of the 20th century, before the Holocaust, between 1918 and 1921, there were over a thousand anti-Jewish riots and military actions commonly referred to as pogroms, throughout that area in 500 different locales, of which is now called Ukraine. So you can think about what the Jewish people in Ukraine have gone through. And this all took place in the midst of what was called civilized Europe. There's so many great books on this. I can't think of any that I would recommend offhand, but definitely you should look it up. If this is something that interests you, this is definitely a really good time to think about um, the Jewish relationship with Ukraine and, and past. And we'll talk soon about the Jew Jewish relationship with Ukraine presently. Now, once World War II started, different nations had different levels of collaboration with the Nazis. There were different levels of anti-Semitism, and let's say, without giving you too many details, Ukraine was the brutal of the brutal. The Ukrainians were so brutal to the Jews in its midst. I mean, obviously, for most of you that are with me here, I don't have to tell you what happened to the Jews of Eastern Europe, to millions of Jews. But I'm telling you because probably you don't know because the Germans kept very meticulous records where the Ukrainians 
and the Russians did not. But we can understand that in Ukraine, and I'll say in Russia as well, there was equal if not a greater catastrophe to the Jewish people, even though we didn't know that, or maybe we don't have the same kind of documentation. I'm telling you this also because the story of Ukraine is part of the Jewish story. Because past the worst catastrophe in Jewish history and perhaps human history to the current day, no one should ever be blamed for what their ancestors believed and acted. It's hard for us to take, to separate that, but that's the reality. And, and sometimes it can be a signal for the way you believe and act as well. If we're talking about Russia invading Ukraine, it happens to be that the president of Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky, is Jewish, which is unbelievable if you think about who he is and what he represents in retrospect of the Jewish community's experience in Ukraine over the years, the fact that today, as we stand in this moment, there's a Jewish president in Ukraine. Um, what they referred to, what the former president uh, uh, Medvedev referred to him as a man with certain ethnic roots, if you can imagine. A man with certain ethnic roots and then suggested that he concealed his Jewish identity to serve the interests of the Ukrainian nationalists. Have you ever heard about Jews hiding who they are to serve the nefarious interests and undermine a country? I mean, okay. And then there's said that his betrayal to Russia, his betrayal, and, and there, there was a, uh, an exact quote that made him like a sonar commando. The sonar commandos were the Jews who were forced to clean the ashes of the bodies of the Jews who were killed in the camps. And when you use that kind of rhetoric about someone, I don't have to tell you that what you're doing is appealing to deep, ingrained anti-Semitic stereotypes in Russia and in Ukraine to undermine the credibility of the president who is, as he said himself, the number one target of the Russian troops right now. Now, this man, I have to say, if you haven't been introduced to him yet, what an amazing human being is Vladimir Zelensky. He started off his career as a comedian, which is funny because we often think of politicians who are comedians, never do we think about comedians who become politicians. But that's just the nature of the world. So you have this Jewish comedian who becomes the president of the Ukraine. And now here he is when so many people have fled and people said that he fled, but he then gets on the public radio and the public television saying no, that he's there and all the people of his cabinet are there and he stayed. Now I wanna get into a little more of what happened, what is the resurgence of the Jewish community of Ukraine? Um, today, the Jewish community of Ukraine after the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, boasts a thriving Jewish infrastructure. There are synagogues, there are mikvahs. There's actually a matzah bakery that provides, I don't know the exact numbers, but I can tell you that we get our matzah from the Ukrainian matzah bakery. And we're a little scared right now as to Pesach coming and the Shmura matzah, the handmade matzah that we rely on uh, for Pesach usually comes from Ukraine. And I've actually been, been uh, putting out some calls to make sure that we'll be able to get our matzah 
being of what's going on over there. There are Jewish schools, there are yeshivas, there are, so, there are social service organizations. The first, the first um, permanent post-Soviet uh, Chabad emissary in Ukraine arrived actually in 1990, and it was still the Soviet Union. He began leading the synagogues in Kharkov, in Dnipro, which then was called Dnepropetrovsk until 2014. And those places had actually just been returned to the Jewish community. And their work built on Chabad's deep roots in the region, including decades of underground Jewish activism throughout the Soviet area era. See, what people don't know is that the reason why Chabad actually um, ended up being really part of the resurgence of Judaism in the post-Soviet Ukraine is because Chabad had been there throughout the, the communism and throughout the Soviet Union. Uh, really with these underground yeshivas and underground institutions. I'm gonna talk about that in a second. So today there are 35 cities of all sizes throughout Ukraine that are served by over 200 Chabad emissary families. And similar to Vladimir Zelensky, all of those Chabad emissary families got together before in the weeks leading up to this, knowing that there's a very good chance that this was gonna happen and decided they're gonna stay and they're there. These rabbis and rebbitsons are there with their communities during this time. And often the Chabad rabbis and their wives create the only Jewish infrastructure in the city. And so there's a story that came out about uh, the Chabad rabbi and rebbitson in Kharkov that took the community in the beginning of, of the raids and said, people come, and they said, we're not, we don't have a shelter, but we'll help you. And they were feeding the community, and they were doing, and, and, and the stories of, of in Odessa, of, the, of the, the orphanage there. These emissaries do not only work with the Jewish communities in their own towns, but they reach out to dozens of smaller cities, towns, of villages around them, arranging and running Jewish holiday programs throughout the year. What's also amazing about Chabad's work in Ukraine is the orphanages. There are two of the most well-known orphanages. One is in Zhitomir and the other one in Odessa. The children were evacuated further west this week. And I believe there's also one in Dnipro. It's far from only relief work that Chabad is engaged in over there, but as the quality of life in Ukraine has risen, so has the quality of Jewish life. And Chabad maintains a Jewish university in Odessa. And in case you haven't seen, all of the shares also has the largest Jewish center in the world in Dnipro called the Menorah Center, which has seven branches. And the philanthropist that built that center wanted that from the sky, uh, I heard him say it myself uh, at a conference a number of years ago, uh, he said from the sky, he wanted people to see the menorah, the menorah center. There are kosher restaurants throughout the country. And so there's this level of material and spiritual comfort that few had predicted just a few decades ago. And so while the world continues to pray for the people of Ukraine, for the Jews of Ukraine, I think it's really, really important for us to, to, think of, to think of them. And this is a, a terrible, terrible tragedy that is happening to Ukraine. And it's not a tragedy of the Jewish people, but we don't hold grudges. And even though I've sat here for the past few minutes telling you about our deep history and the difficulty of anti-Semitism. But a lot of people have questioned me over the past week, uh, the various things I've shared saying, well, don't you remember about the deep anti-Semitism? I do, but we don't hold grudges. And there's a terrible thing that's going on now. We know history, we remember history, but we also thank God of those people in the Jewish community and at large who have been able to flee. 
And we think about the fact that the Jews did not have a place to go in 1648 and 1649. The Jews did not have a place to go in 1918 and 1919. And God knows they didn't have a place to go in 1942 and 43. But now they do. And our job, whether physically or spiritually, is to make sure that they get there. And thank God, when something comes up for the Jewish community, for the first time in history, we can see the realities of private jets that were chartered to Israel from Ukraine. Many private jets that, that were chartered through the Jewish community and that we have a place to go. And what I always love, and I think about what the meaning of home is, home is a place where you're accepted unconditionally. And here in Montreal, I think of our Chabad Center as a home where we accept people unconditionally. There's no question, whoever the person is, wherever they come from, and if they come to us, we will accept them for who they are without any judgment, completely unconditionally. And it's beautiful to see that we really, as a Jewish community, have a universal home where we're accepted unconditionally. And as difficult as this time is now, I think that people ask what they can do. How can you be part of it? Because I always think of the bystander effect that often we hear of these terrible things going on. But the fact is, who am I? I'm just a simple, simple person. What can I do? So the first thing is we have a body and we have a soul. So therefore there are material things that we can do and there are spiritual things that we can do. Materially, we can donate. There are really great places that we can donate to right now. If you need a list of those places, um, I'm happy to send them to you, or I'm just going to put a, a note here below the video with a link to some of the places that you can give tzedakah. And it's interesting because during times of war, there are three things that we do as a Jewish community. Number one is we pray. And so therefore pick up a book of Psalms, a book of Tehillim, and say a prayer for them and, and send your spiritual vibes to the people. Study. Just You can just Google it. Study some Torah thought or something beautiful and study and then give charity. So we do prayer, study, and charity. And those are the three things that averts the severity of a decree, as we say in the Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah prayers. Those are the things that we can do spiritually and one of them is also something we can do physically, is we can actually give. And if you have the means to be able to give more, give more. And if you have the means to be able to physically get involved in helping, physically get involved in helping, because I'm sure that they physically need help in whatever way that we can. And Hashem should bless that the Jews of Ukraine and the people of Ukraine should enter a time of absolute peace. And that this should be over very soon and that we can then turn to our parents and our grandparents and our great-grandparents, who probably our great-grandparents fled from Ukraine. And they were the ones who had the wisdom and the foresight to leave that place. And we can say to them that though you left, we remember that that place still was, is in your heart and souls. And we remember the communities that live there and those people who still remain. And Hashem should bless each and every one of you and each and every one of them with health and the ability to have peace, real peace. The perfect word, shalom, absolute peace. Have a wonderful day.